All right, aloha. Thank you all for attending today's talk. Um, delivered by Dr. Keawe Aimoku Kaholokula and Dr. Kekoa Tapara. Um, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kaholokula, a tenured professor and chair of Native Hawaiian Health at the John A. Burns School of Medicine in Hawaii, as well as a licensed clinical psychologist. He is a translational behavioral scientist who has led multiple federally funded research projects aimed at explaining, preventing, or treating cardiometabolic related medical conditions in Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders to achieve health equity. His work is chronicled in over 140 publications and has an impact on the local, regional, national, and international levels to bring systemic improvements to healthcare delivery, clinical outcomes, and policy. As a Native Hawaiian, he is passionate about improving the health of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and has made a commitment to improving their social and cultural determinants of health. And with that, I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Koholokula. Mahalo. Avelina Mekeola Yakako. Just real quickly, I should know this, but how many of you are JAPSOM students? Aloha, Amanda. Just one. With COVID, with COVID these days, it's hard to to uh, get to know the students from a distance often. Uh, so, aloha. Um, who's from Hawaii? Real quickly. All right, Celeste, Gwen, Matt. Okay. So, uh, aloha again, everyone. Let me get my screen up here, and we'll get going. So, the title of my talk is really Pai Pai Kiko, who are setting that solid foundation, and how to do that through looking at the social and cultural determinants of health for Native Hawaiians has uh, much relevance to other Pacific Islanders as well, although uh, my presentation here will hone in on Native Hawaiians. And I always like to start my talk um, really going back in time, because often, you know, when we work in, in the medical profession and the health sciences, you know, we understand Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander health on average to be, to be worse than most other ethnic groups. Uh, in the United States, here in Hawaii as well. And often that becomes the norm. Unfortunately, uh, but yeah, unfortunately it becomes the norm. But if we go back in time to 1778, at the time of uh, the arrival of Captain James Cook and his expedition to Hawaii and into the Pacific, and uh, if we look at their writings, they kept detailed journals of their uh, daily experience in these islands. And they wrote some really remarkable remarkable things about our ancestors. And it really speaks to the, the health and well-being that they enjoy prior to Western intrusion on these islands. And I think this is similar for most indigenous populations. The natives of these islands, for example, are in, uh, as said by Captain James King, are in general above middle size, well-made, walk gracefully, run nimbly, capable of great fatigue. And now we have the highest obesity rates. So I think we're not as graceful and nimble as we our ancestors were. Um, but also the social nature. Uh, what they stumbled upon was a very uh, uh, thriving population that was quite uh, friendly, counter with what the missionaries led the world to believe in 1820 when they came to Hawaii and um, created some false narratives around the existence of our, our people being in fear of their lives by the uh, terrible elite. It was, that was not the case at all. It was a thriving, healthy, robust population that was enjoying a good quality of life from all accounts from the writings of the, uh, the captains. And David Samuel there, that's uh, the quote from the bottom, was the surgeon on board Captain Cook's expedition. So as we all know, I unfortunately because of time, I can't really do a, a comprehensive overview of the, uh, the events that led to uh, poorer health status for Native Hawaiians, really starting from the arrival in 1778, as I pointed out with, with Captain James Cook and his expedition. And what we saw with the uh, Westerners coming in, not just Westerners, but also uh, eventually Asian immigrants coming in, was the, the uh, introduction of infectious diseases for which our, pop, our, our native population, our ancestors had no natural immunity to ward off. So what we saw was an a, a incredible decline in the population between 1778 and the 1900s, the early 1900s. And what you have here is the best estimates now that we, uh, that we have based on modern demographic techniques that actually show the population of Native Hawaiians or 
natives at the time, of course, weren't called native Hawaiians until later, uh, was 700,000 strong, uh, which is much higher than what the census uh, shows for native Hawaiians today in the United States. And then our, our population declined greater than 95% by the late 1900s. Um, and then but the good news is our population is on the rise. Uh, by 2060, we're expected to, uh, again, reach the 700,000 mark, if not exceed that. Other estimates actually show us approaching a million across the United States. But let me return to today and the circumstances we have. We have moved away from the, well, aside from COVID, of course, we have really moved away from the issue of infectious diseases uh, really uh, affecting our population to that of chronic diseases. And I have some of the chronic diseases here that are either higher or among the highest for Native Hawaiians when you compare to other ethnic groups and whites. Of course, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all interrelated, of course. Adverse childhood experiences we have more of, which also, as we know from research, uh, uh, sets you up for these other uh, chronic diseases and mental health conditions in adulthood such as uh, trauma, depression, suicide is very, very high among our population and substance use. And given all this, we have a life expectancy that's about 10 years shorter, a whole decade than other ethnic groups. When you look at the, high, the longest living ethnic group in Hawaii, Chinese, it's about a 15 year gap between native Hawaiians and the Chinese population. And we get these diseases an average of 10 years younger research shows um, for one of the examples here is that we're, we're seeing now, and it's not unique to Native Hawaiians, it seems to be the case with many indigenous populations, is that we're seeing earlier onset of Alzheimer's. Um, and that might be due to the early onset of vascular risk factors for Alzheimer's, such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. But when we really look at what accounts for health inequities in the United States, um, and what we, what, we, what we suspect from good research, actually, and a, from a number of uh, different disciplines and just uh, over the years, better research coming out, trying to better account for um, the social, cultural, behavioral, medical factors that contribute to health inequities. And what we really see is that a great deal of it really is upstream. When you look at social economic factors combined with physical environment where people live, work, play, learn is that a, 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 this, at least 50% in this model that you're seeing here, but in other models, it has it anywhere to up, up to 60, 70% of um, health inequities really being accounted for by what might be considered social determinants of health. And then the rest is really the, the behaviors that people have that choose, uh, well, I hate to say that because people don't choose to be unhealthy, but their lifestyle behaviors access the quality of clinical care that they receive, which as we all know is inequitable across different groups. But, so what I'm, the point here is really that there are these upstream factors that we need to pay attention to if we're really going to close the gap, uh, in this case, between Native Hawaiians and other ethnic groups. So we talk about the social determinants of health. I think many of you are very familiar with this term. About maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I used to present on social determinants of health, it was fairly not something spoken about often and taught. Uh, nowadays, I, I see that more and more people are talking about social determinants of health, and we're having greater research in this area. But what is, what is social determinants? It's really the economic, social, and environmental conditions and their distribution among the population that influence individual and group uh, differences in health status. And they include the presence or absence of discrimination in employment, education, housing, health care, livable wages, for example, and living in safe neighborhoods. On the right here, as you see, this is one of the uh, social determinants of health figures that we created for one of our research grants to really demonstrate the, the multiple levels of influence that we see. And the, some of the specific factors our communities are telling us through research that are issues for them, and, uh, whether good or bad, that help either facilitate or, uh, or are barriers to them uh, living healthy and receiving good health care. And uh, as you can see, it's very, very uh, uh, diverse and multifaceted across multiple levels, as, you, as we know, that they are not just saying that the, the individual choices that I make are affecting my health, but the conditions under which I live, work, and play, for example, influences that as well. And what we do know from research here in Hawaii is, uh, this is uh, 
a saying that I think many of you probably heard before. It's more to do, it has more to do with your zip code than your genetic code when it comes to health status for, for many people. And when we look in Hawaii uh, at areas where uh, predominantly Native Hawaiian communities, we see the lowest life expectancy in Hawaii compared to the dark blue, which is the highest. The dark blue that you see are in more affluent areas, uh, downtown Honolulu, all the, way, all the way out to Hawaii Kai. What's interesting, if you go to the far right of the Oahu Island, the larger uh, island there, if you go down to the right side, you'll see that on the bottom, there's all that dark blue. Right over that mountain there, the yellow is the lowest. And they're just right around the corner, right? So obviously it's not, it has nothing to do with, uh, um, you know, um, probably, you know, something that would be affecting, they're so close together, in other words, that there is something else going on uh, beyond simply uh, attributing this to access to care and other issues because they're, they're just right over the mountain and there's no difference in the, their access to good care and so forth. So what we suspect is really the cultural determinants of health. But when I talk about native people, we, we have another uh, determinant that's very, very important. And now on an international level, we are advocating that colonization is a determinant of health. But what I've uh, been talking about is cultural determinants of health, which is might be a little different than other ethnic groups, uh, other ethnic groups that are immigrants or refugees to the US. Uh, for native people, there is an aspiration to maintain their cultural traditions, practices, and language and not really assimilate into the mainstream, but perhaps to be bicultural or multicultural, but definitely to retain their cultural affiliations and practices. So what is cultural determinants health of health? It's really the social cultural conditions that influence individual and group differences. For indigenous people, as I pointed out, it's maintaining cultural tr traditions and sacred places, access to tr ancestral lands, protecting our natural and cultural resources, having a strong indigenous identity and being able to assert that identity in the mainstream without discrimination. But there's also the issues of historical and cultural trauma our communities are facing because of the tremendous loss, not just loss of life and family members during the 1800s that dwindled our population down to barely uh, 30,000 by the, the end of the uh, 1900s, but also the many uh, political factors other factors that have really, with the loss of our kingdom, the illegal overthrow uh, in 1893 of our sovereign, Queen Lili Okalani, we became second rate citizens under the US system. And then we started to see a tremendous uh, decline in the 1900s uh, of, the, of the health of Native Hawaiians and their, their, so, their uh, social status. So all these factors contribute to the health and well being of Native Hawaiians today. And if I was to depict this in a single, uh, figure here, here it is, social and cultural determinants of health. We go to the far left, the historical determinants, they're non-modifiable, we can't change them. These are the only determinants for which we have no control over, they're historical. But I include them to show the, drast the drastic changes, and these are just a few examples that really put Native Hawaiians at a disadvantage in their own homeland and made them second-rate citizens. And then of course, if you go down to the next pillar, from left to right, we have the social, political, socioeconomic determinants. Uh, and some of them are really good. We have the International Indigenous Rights Movement. The UN has put out uh, the indigenous rights. The US has signed on to that. Uh, Native rights and institutions that we have currently. Our elite legacy programs, such as Kamehameha Schools, for example, uh, do uh, improve our social and cultural determinants of health because they educate uh, a number of our Native Hawaiian students and give them uh, good access to good education, which sets them for, uh, for success in the future. And there's public policies and so forth. But we also know that policies also work against us here in Hawaii, uh, such as the issue with TMT, uh, protecting our, our cultural resources. Now, I'll give you an example of social political, well, I'm gonna hold off on that. Social and economic determinants are next, uh, where, you know, where we live, work, play really affects our well, health and well-being whether we live in neighborhoods that are safe, have uh, access to uh, parks, playgrounds, and workable, walkable communities, uh, the level of family and community support we're able to receive. Of course, our education opportunities lead to uh, occupational income opportunities in the future. And then we have cultural determinants of health, as I explained earlier. 
And then finally, on the far right pillar is really the biological, psychological, or behavioral determinants, right? Now, this is where we spend all our attention. All of you are going to become experts in the biological determinants of health and how to treat that. But as you can see, it's really a downstream factor, right? It's, it's, it's the, to me, and I'm a psychologist, so you know, I'll pick on, we focus on the individual. And as long as I'm treating them, uh, they do well. But once that, once that stops, life, life happens and all these other cultural, social and cultural determinants of health uh, comes back into play infecting them and it's very difficult for them to maintain any positive changes they made. Same with people's chronic disease management or prevention. These are, so we really need to think upstream uh, to prevent these issues from happening. And even after they happen, uh, it affects the, people's ability to manage their health and live healthy. Mauliola is really a more a traditional way of looking at health and well-being. And Mohala Ikavaik Mako Kapu is actually a Hawaiian proverb that is an ancient one prior to the, the notion of social determinants of health, but it was a notion of social determinants of health. Mohala Ikavaik Mako Kapu simply translate as uh, the, the, the flowers blossom because of the water. Uh, it, it is really the that the flowers can only thrive or, or people can only thrive where living conditions are good. Now, I know we have very little time, so I'm gonna quickly take you through, I'm gonna hone in on uh, one cultural, cultural or social determinant of health, racism, discrimination, and how racism and discrimination can get under a person's skin to really affect their health and well-being. Now, when we looked at the acculturation, acculturation strategies, Actually, this is a uh, research I did when I was an undergraduate. And we were interested at the time, there was a theory of in psychology, cultural psychology around acculturation coming out of Canada by Ucho Kim and John Berry. And they were saying that the health status that we see across different ethnic groups is a function of, of many things. One being uh, these acculturation molds or strategies that people end up um, acquiring or, or using to, to adapt to the situation they're in, whether you're an immigrant, whether you're a refuge, refugee, or whether you're a native person, uh, living within a, you know, a settler community or society uh, or where there is a mainstream group that, um, for which you are not uh, a member of by, you know, by ethnicity and background. But, um, they said that you could be integrated or bicultural. Traditional, which is, um, so integrated, you have a high affiliation for both your, your ethno-cultural group. You wanna maintain those uh, affiliations and identity, but at the same time, you want to adopt uh, the uh, mainstream identity and you, you assimilate, well, you integrate. So you have a little bit of both. It's bicultural. Then we have the traditional or what was traditionally called separatist. That is uh, high on the Hawaiian or the ethno-cultural side and low for whatever reason on the mainstream, or in this case, the American side. Assimilated is, uh, you flip that around, it's high on the American, low on the uh, cultural, and the marginalized is low on both. And this is, a, this is looking at depression symptoms across Native Hawaiians that were categorized based on a, multi, uh, a, a scale of identity that was uh, developed specific for Native Hawaiians that compare their affiliation with their native Hawaiian culture with that of the mainstream. And we were able to categorize them into these categories based on this theory. Now the percentage is the percent of participants, native Hawaiian participants who ended up uh, based on uh, this multi-item scale being categorized as, uh, into these four categories. 70% were bicultural, 23% were traditional, only 1% assimilated, 6% marginalized. This uh, study actually has been replicated several times on several islands in several different native Hawaiian samples with two different measures of acculturation and identity. And we get almost the exact same distribution. It's anywhere between 70 and 73% for bicultural, uh, 19 to 23% for traditional, one to 2% for assimilated, and about four to 6% marginalized. So they roughly, they're, they're pretty much the same. So whether we're, it's a valid construct, I don't know, but we're measuring it reliably across time. But here, what you see is the depression score. So the number below 70%, for example, 13.5, is the mean score for their depression, uh, depression score, which is a combination of the Beck Depression Inventory and the CESD, Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale. 
And what we see here is that the traditional group has the highest mean score, even after adjusting for age, education level, Native Hawaiian degree of ancestry, because as you know, many Native Hawaiians are of mixed ethnic ancestry. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit. Uh, what we're seeing is that yet there's a high, there's higher depression among the traditional group. This was counter to our hypotheses. We actually thought the traditional group would uh, have the lowest because we because of their, their strong and exclusive Hawaiian identity. But I'll come back to that after this presentation. Then we did a similar uh, study in another sample of Native Hawaiians looking at diabetes risk. And this, these uh, people with diabetes in this study were confirmed cases of diabetes. They weren't based on self-report. There were confirmed cases of diabetes. And what we found was that also the traditional group had the highest risk for diabetes. Uh, so the, the prevalence for the entire sample here of 495 Native Hawaiians is 19.1%. But when you start breaking them out into the four acculturation modes, what you see is very large differences in the risk. And similar to depression, the traditional group had the highest risk. Almost 30% of them had diabetes versus 15%, for example, half of that with the uh, integrated group. And I'm only focusing on those two because that's where a bulk of the uh, participants were. The numbers were are too small to make any sense of the simulated and marginalized. But the point, what, the, the, what's interesting here is the, the, the uh, similarity with our depression uh, results. And if you don't know, depression now is considered a risk factor for diabetes independent of other known risk factors. People with major depression are three times more likely to develop diabetes, for example, independent of the other risk factors that we know of. So something's going on, but we don't think it's the, it's, it's, it's the Hawaiian identity per se that's the issue. It's more correlational, right? What we believe is the issue is that Native Hawaiians who are strongly identifying with their Hawaiian culture are experiencing more racism. And in fact, that's the case when we do look at racism and account for the acculturation modes. What we're really finding is that racism really is the factor that's affecting the health of Native Hawaiians. Uh, Kikoa, you might appreciate this. This is Stanford students. Uh, protesting the use of uh, our uh, traditional attire as costumes or for, for Halloween and for parties. Uh, but when we look at the experience of racism for Native Hawaiians over the past 12 months, a majority of 48% uh, 40, of they're saying that it, it happens often to most of the time. 52% say it happens sometimes. None of them say none of the time. That's, that's the interesting part. In a state that prides itself on cultural and ethnic harmony, uh, often uh, when I first started this research over 12 years ago, people were telling me, there's no racism here. Uh, well, ask a Native Hawaiian, they'll tell you there is racism. Ask a Pacific Islander, they'll tell you there's racism. So what are the effects of racism on health? I'm gonna make it quick to get, I know we have to get the, uh, turn over this over to Dr. Tutukekoa uh, and then, uh, so I'll just say that we found that racism is associated with a number of factors among Native Hawaiians, one being hypertension risk, the other being obesity, the other is psychological distress, mainly mediated by certain coping strategies. Uh, the other thing we looked at is cardiovascular reactivity and recovery. Um, so as you probably, you might know this, that uh, cardiovascular reactivity, how, how fast we react to a, a stressor and how long it takes us for recover when the stressor is no longer around or in our environment, right? And how long we take to recover back to baseline in our, in our heart rate and blood pressure and so forth. This pr does predict risk for cardiovascular disease in the future among many ethnic groups. And we're seeing something similar with Native Hawaiians and racism, uh, using racism as a, as a stressor. And then I've done studies looking at uh, the relationship between just cortisol and blood pressure. Um, what's interesting in racism, we see a flattened cortisol activity. Usually with a stress, a stressor, you see an increase in cortisol activity and you see a whole cascade of events in the body to prepare for the fight or flight response, right? Uh, in, our, in this case, uh, chronic stress, long stress over a long period of time actually leads to other problems such as um, hypocortisolism, for example, is the, is the term that other, uh, the, the the issue that people are, are looking at these days. And here, just to depict uh, the multiple ways in which racism affects our health and well being, whether it's through, directly through the psychological stress that impacts us on a physiological level, or whether it's uh, denial of goods and other social determinants of health issues. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually at my at 20 minutes, I believe, right? 
I'm going to go ahead and stop here and turn it over to you, Dr. Kikoa. Thank you so much, Dr. Kahulukula. And Dr. Tapar, are you able to um, share screen from your end? I'll share my screen now. Perfect. That, that was a really nice kind of segue into some of the things that I'll talk about. Um, just pulling things up. And I apologize in advance if you, if you hear my pup. He's uh, kind of not happy that I'm in, <laughs> in, in my office right now. Uh, let's see. Yep, so our second speaker will be Dr. Kikua Tapara, a Native Hawaiian radiation oncology physician scientist trainee at Stanford Medicine. He was born and raised in Mililani in Hawaii um, and is a Kamehameha Schools graduate. He completed his PhD at John Hopkins School of Medicine in Cellular and Molecular Medicine, followed by an MD at Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. His research covers many topics, including Pacific Islander health disparities, access to cancer care disparities, oligometastatic prostate cancer, and the impact of cancer healthcare costs have on survival outcomes. He is passionate about mentoring underrepresented individuals in medicine. He is working towards his life mission of returning home to the islands to provide high quality cancer care to Hawaii's community. And with that, I will now turn over the floor to Dr. Tapara. Awesome, thanks so much for the introduction. Just want to double check. Can you see this screen with uh, perfect? Cool. Um, and show by show of hands again. Uh, how many MS ones do we have again? Okay, one MS one. Oh yeah, and Celeste, you're the one from Hawaii. Yeah? And where are you from? Uh, I'm from Kaneohe, but I grew up in Las Vegas. Okay, cool, cool. And then um, MS twos. Okay, and, and MS3s and MS4s. Okay, cool. We have like a really good spread, so that's perfect. Um, I knew that Dr. Kohobukuda was gonna do a really good kind of introduction on kind of uh, social determinants of health and healthcare disparities, because he's the expert in that. So I kind of tailored my talk, so it's not so much about kind of data, even though there's a little bit about it. But I hope that, Kind of some of this goes into something applicable to each one of you in, in terms of your stages of where you're at in medical school. Um, uh, so this is kind of my, my uh, outline. I'll go through some background, talk about my journey to medicine, um, talk about residency, and then do a brief uh, kind of talk on, on some of my research that I've been doing, and then wrap up with some tips for med school. So uh, as some background for myself, um, so I'm from Mililani, I'm from Oahu. Um, these are my, this is my family, this is my parents. Both my parents are native Hawaiian um, and I was really lucky um, and I got to uh, attend Kamehameha schools. Um, I graduated from O8. Um, do any of you know Kamehameha schools at all or anything like that? Yeah, so uh, it's founded by, uh, Dr. Kohoro who I mentioned it, um, but it's founded by our princess, Bernice Bohe Bishop. Uh, it was actually Founders Day this week. Um, she's the princess who kind of founded the school on her deathbed. So if you remember the U-shaped curve that Dr. Kohoro Kula showed us, at the very bottom of that U-shaped curve, that's when um, uh, Bernice Bohe Bishop was uh, dying on her deathbed from breast cancer and wanted to found, use her trust to found a school called Kamehameha Schools for Indigenous youth, so Native Hawaiians. Um, and that's kind of where I did my um, kind of formative years of education. Um, and from that, I, I was a swimmer. I was not smart. I was not like all the brainiacs at, of my school, I was like very much just trying to get through life. I was a swimmer. And so I decided um, for college, I went to Fairfield University. It's a Jesuit school out on the East Coast in Connecticut. Um, I started out as a comp sci major. I, I think I wanted to either be a dolphin trainer or like be one of the Apple like sales retail people in the beginning of my of my school years. But then I decided um, quickly that comp sci was not for me. And I uh, double majored in biology and psychology and I triple minored in Asian studies, math and philosophy. Um, a lot of cultural shifts and changes in terms of surviving the East Coast. Um, I always joke that my study abroad in Japan was less of a study abroad than being in Connecticut compared to Hawaii. But so that was kind of, um, so I met so many great mentors who kind of taught me about loving research. You know, I, I was a D1 swimmer, but 
I, uh, you know, got involved in academia and academics through a lot of really great mentorship. So at the end of my college years, decided to go to actually do my PhD first. So uh, I chose to go to Johns Hopkins. Um, I was in the Solium Molecular Medicine program. It's the first translational medicine program, um, I think, in the country or the world. But um, I really wanted to focus on cancer. I have, as a native Hawaiian, all my native Hawaiian family members, there's like at least 10, no, it's actually increasing, but 10 family members with cancer, most of whom have passed away, unfortunately, running the gamut from pediatric neuroblastoma up to like the bread and butter prostate cancer. So I was really interested in, in cancer um, for my PhD. I ended up um, joining Food Trans Lab. Um, he's a radiation oncologist, physician scientist. He um, uh, d does a lot of work on with mouse models and molecular mechanisms for epithelial mesenchymal transition. So it's basically the metastasis, how does cancer metastasize and go throughout the body? But I specifically looked at how um, a novel sugar pathway actually fuels, um, it, it hijacks that program in order to kind of promote tumor genesis and, and acceleration of, um, of tumor growth and specifically a lung cancer model. So that was my time at Hawkins and specifically Dr. Tran, you know, so my parents are in that photo, but my mom is a public high school teacher from Milani. My dad, uh, you know, started out as a power plant out of, you know, um, when he was really young, he's worked in the mail room and kind of just worked his way up at, at a Hawaiian electric company at, or a power plant. And so, you know, no one in my family is in medicine, no one in my family is in academia or like uh, science. And so um, this Dr. Tran was like the first person who I ever kind of got to meet, who was, uh, you know, in science and in, in medicine. And he brought me into the clinic and was like, hey, look, I can cure these patients from their cancer. And like, at that point, I was like, all my family with prostate cancer have all died. Like, how, how do you save these people? And so he was the one towards the end of my PhD was like, you should consider going to medical school. So I was like, I don't know, like, how many years is it? Like, do I have to take a test to get in? I knew nothing about the process. And so he was the one who kind of encouraged me to go and like walk me through the steps. And so I decided to go to Mayo Clinic for a medical school. Um, this is my class here. It's a very small, like 50 of us. You get to know each other, whether or not you want to know each other. <laughs> and very intimately with a small classroom size, you know, I went to uh, I went to Jacksonville and Phoenix campuses. Um, it was a really great experience um, overall. Um, during my time there, my very first year, I actually got to go to Wyoming Health Center and um, uh, Queens West Oahu, uh, West Oahu. So, you know, if you remember Dr. Kahulu Kula, when he put on the maps of um, the life expectancies, the yellow regions, that's kind of where I did my, um, some of my practicals um, uh, to learn kind of in the very beginning how to become a doctor. So, um, and Mayo paid for that and it was a really great experience. Um, and so, you know, pre-clinical years, then transition to, you know, you get into your organ systems, MS2, right? So, like, I just, I didn't bring this picture up in cardiology, like, again, no one in my family was in medicine, like, I had, I had classmates who, like, knew since, like, elementary school what a heart attack was, and I just remember being in cardiology, I'm like, oh, there's, like, vessels that feed the heart, and, like, those get clogged, I had no idea what plumbing was, like, I had no idea what any of this was. And I, re I distinctly remember like in cardiology midterm exam getting like, a, for some reason our professor like put up a, like the distribution of the scores up on the screen. And then I flip my paper and I'm literally the last person. And I'm like, oh wow, I really know nothing. And it was really humbling experience to go through medical school, like not knowing anything. And, you know, again, like some of the information that I was just learning people knew from like when they were kids and it was just because like their parents were doctors or whatever. So I had a lot to um, catch up on. Um, and, you know, for the MS3s, you know, or whenever you start your clinical years, right, you have to go through that too. And so for me, um, it was also a struggle. Um, you know, I was always like, just be a good person. Everyone told me like, oh, just be a good person. That's all you have to do. And then you're like honors. But you know, obviously it's like the spotlight is always on you and you always feel like you're being judged all the time and um, you have to take the shelf exams. And so there's a lot of pressure on you, right? As a medical student. And I will always remember like well-intended resident brings me into the, like a, literally a closet in the, inside of the room 
um, on my medicine rotation and he was like, hey, you need to do a better job at your presentations. They aren't very good. You're making me look bad, blah, blah, blah. And so he like was like practice right here in front of me. And I was like literally looking at my little sh cheat sheet of notes and like I blanked and deer in the headlights, I didn't know anything. And it was uh, a lot of those times like happened and it, it was really tough. Um, uh, but you know, you, I just went, got sought out help. Um, uh, Mayo was really good at giving me tutors and stuff like that. But, but I just worked really hard. Um, and then eventually, you know, I, I capitalized on my strengths. Um, so like, I'm not really good at like knowing the clinical knowledge, like when I was in med school, but like I knew how to like analyze data. And so I, I really applied to like as many grants as I could um, during medical school, um, got a lot of papers done. And I, I tried to focus on like my weaknesses of like cardiology, right? Like my worst class in medical school. I focused on like, how can we reduce cardiotoxicity for our, our um, pediatric patients with mediastinal lymphoma so we can reduce cardiotoxicity from radiation side effects long-term, right? So I tried to transform some of the things that I was bad at into some of the things that I was like a little bit better at. And so um, that was really fun. And then obviously for the MS4s, good luck during interviews right now. Um, this is a picture of my team, Dr. Walaski. This is like just when COVID's happening. So we're like, it went back and forth whether or not match day was gonna be in person, but eventually it was, everyone was like in 10 different places throughout Mayo, uh, socially distant. And she just handed, that's my envelope. She handed it to me. That's a picture. I went down into the basement, went into a room with my wife and we opened the letter in front of my parents. And, you know, throughout all the stress and all the, you know, tests and everything, constantly being judged and you know your MS3 year like open my envelope and then I match to Stanford so I, I just say this as a point of like you know you work really hard you you struggle but eventually things can fall into place as long as you keep at it and you keep working hard um and it, so so that's me matching to Stanford but obviously before residency for a lot of the advanced practice um you know like derm anesthesiology um, path radiology etc we have to do our intern year so I did um I matched to my number one which was Gunderson it's out in Wisconsin if any of you are applying right now um like get a TY and, and enjoy your life for the first year but um, uh, this is me during my uh, intern year. Uh, you know, I, I saw some of the craziest things on the front line for COVID. I was in the ICU with one to two patients dying on me every single day, um, which was super tough. Uh, trauma surgery. I saw some of the worst traumas I've ever seen in my life that I don't ever want to see again. Um, emergency medicine, you know, you, you do all of that and you learn how to become a doctor. You, you apply what you learned in medical school and you, and you, become the doctor that you want to be. And so that's kind of uh, the transition to intern year. And then now I'm here at Stanford. I'm a resident in the Department of Radiation Oncology. It's just a privilege to be able to learn um, how to treat cancer um, and, and cure these patients with cancer uh, using our advanced radiation oncology techniques. Um, if any of you are interested in RADONC or you know, uh, for the MS123s, um, happy to chat about um, radiation oncology. I think it's a hidden gem. Not a lot of people know about it. Really, the only reason why I even knew about it was because of my mentor when I was a, a PhD student. So it's a it's a hidden gem. We do a lot of really great things for for cancer patients. And so that's kind of me. That's kind of the background. Um, I'll just really quickly touch upon some of the things um, that I think are important. Uh, these are just three of my papers that I published this year. Um, uh, so the first is just kind of a general health forum uh, paper. I, I try to put into context how far away the Pacific is relative to the continental US. Cause I think a lot of times, you know, I remember in elementary school seeing the map and then like Hawaii and Alaska are just like somewhere near Mexico. And like, it's really far away. And, and I think a lot of people forget how far removed we are from um, being, you know, being in Hawaii. And a lot of people don't know which islands are Hawaii. These are the eight of them. But remember that the archipelago kind of goes like the 5,000 uh, islands up towards Japan because of the tectonic plate moving. But anyway, uh, in terms of the Pacific, I think that um, it, it's, it's uh, a lot of people forget that there's so many different islands in the Pacific. Um, these, are, these are just some fun facts. Like, it's the world's largest ocean, a third of the Earth's um, surface. All, um, the Pacific is greater than all landmass combined. 
um, half of Earth's water. There's about 20,000 islands, 42 million people. And there are actually countries, right? So like 20 to 30 countries within the Pacific. And I think a lot of times when we think of like Asia as being so diverse, there's a lot of diversity within the Pacific as well. Um, and so, you know, we think about Hawaii being from the United States um, because it's a state, but, um, you know, and I think a lot of people recognize Polynesia, but when we think about Pacific Islanders and who they are, we're really talking about the ethno, these three ethnogeographic regions. So there's Polynesia, which everyone knows about because there's like Kauai, obviously, but then Samoa, um, um, uh, but also like Aotearoa, which is New Zealand, um, Sa um, Tonga, etc. Um, but a lot of people don't re recognize like Micronesia, so there's a lot of Micronesians. Um, I'm doing a clinical trial actually right now, collaborating with a group in um, Northern Mariana Islands, so that's one. Palau is also there, Guam is there. Um, and then uh, in yellow is um, Melanesia, a lot of people know Fiji, so that's, that's, um, uh, that's in Melanesia. So really when we say Pacific Islanders, we're not talking about the Philippines, we're not talking about Japan. Yes, they are islands in the Pacific, but we're not talking about these three ethnogeographic regions. And I think some of you might be laughing, but like people get confused with this all the time, including even Filipinos. Um, so it's, it's just something that we, um, I try to educate on because I don't think that people recognize these three ethnogeographic regions of the Pacific. So each one of these countries has their own indigenous people. In Hawaii, um, there are native Hawaiians and we give them the native designation in the United States because of um, these are people who have ancestral ties um, to lands that are currently occupied by the United States. So like uh, they're actually classified as Native American. So if you look at what the actual like federal government Native American designation is, um, Native Hawaiians are part of that because again, they're indigenous people to lands occupied by the United States. Um, Native Hawaiians are the most um, populous of the Pacific Islanders, and uh, so that's why a lot of uh, research is focused on uh, Native Hawaiians as a surrogate for Pacific Islanders. Um, but this is just data from the Cancer Tumor Registry out in Hawaii, um, and you can see that across the board for cancer, which is again my specialty, we have mortality rates higher than any other ethnic group for many, many, many cancers, uh, if not all of them. And so the that's kind of, again, my personal background, 10 family members um, with cancer, uh, dying of things that you know we routinely cure in, in, in our clinical practice. So it's just, um, for me, that's been one of the uh, kind of triggers of why I wanna study this. In terms of Native Hawaiians, they've had have the highest rates of cancer, but they, as Dr. Kulu Kulu mentioned, also have the highest rates of all these other chronic illnesses in Hawaii, at least compared to all ethnic groups. And so that again portends the the worst, um, shortest lifespan um, that Dr. Kulu Kulu also mentioned. So that's kind of the overview. Specific papers that have um, published. Uh, so this was just. Uh, about representation of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in uh, medicine. So, you know, we didn't get our first uh, quote unquote physician until 1975. Um, and then again, the majority of Pacific Islanders and, and in particular Native Hawaiians go into primary care. So it's like only like less than a, like 20 to 30 percent, I think, of the country. Um, goes to primary care, but like it's like seven, up to 75% depending on the year um, for Native Hawaiians going to primary care. Um, and there's like lots, there's very limited people who go into like specialty programs. Um, so that is that. Uh, oh, never mind. And then in terms of why this is important, um, oftentimes when we look at a AAPI, right, Asian American Pacific Islander, when we clump them together, and so Actually, when you disaggregate that, so a lot of my work is on data disaggregation. So like when we, um, like there's a LET study from um, from JAMA Network Open that also did this to looking at um, representative quotients. But anyway, it's Asians in general as the non-disaggregated Asian group have three to four times representation compared to the US 
um, census, but Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander as a disaggregated group actually has a third of the representation compared to the US population. So when we clump them all, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders together, we actually are saying like, oh look, they're so overrepresented in medicine, but in reality, there are like no Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in medicine, which kind of leads to your point, right? Of why you guys were saying that you're trying to get more Pacific Islander into this, um, uh, into your organization, um, trying to recruit. Um, uh, people to kind of give more talks on this because there are really none of us in this field. And, and I think that that's a, a major limitation to kind of educating, right? Because none of the people who um, uh, who say they have ancestral ties to the Pacific are actually in medicine. Um, and uh, so this is just a study showing across all 20 specialties for both the resident level and then um, also the academic faculty. Those are also going down for all 20 specialties. Well, so we need to increase representation and uh, increase uh, so the, uh, we have to improve the leaky pipeline for the uh, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders who are trying to get through into medicine. And I think a, a point on that is just this past year, you know, in addition to my struggles, I knew one um, medical student who dropped out who's Hawaiian. I knew another Samoan guy who um, didn't match. I knew another Hawaiian guy who also didn't match. Um, and then uh, another one is going to graduate, but might not even pursue medicine after. So I think there's a lot of leakiness to the pipeline, and it kind of asks the question of like, why is why is this happening? And then so lastly, just very briefly on again, cancer is what I study. This is just a breast cancer study that I just published, looking at Native Hawaiian women or all ethnic groups in Hawaii using the cancer registry back home. Um, I, I partnered with the Cancer Center and Native Hawaiian women. We found that Native Hawaiian women have higher rates of ipsilateral and contralateral breast cancer after already being treated for DCIS, which is like a quote unquote pre-malignancy. But you know, DCIS should be easily treatable. Um, you get lumpectomy, you get radiation, and then they're like super high cure rates. They should be cured. But then there are these select few patients who are getting second cancers. And so we found that Native Hawaiians are the highest risk um, for both either on the same side or the other side um, of their breast. And so this is, I'm just gonna leave, this is the last data thing I'll talk about, but this is a project unpublished, but I'm hopefully gonna submit the manuscript this month. Um, uh, when we look at AAPI versus white for breast cancer, right, this is a national cancer database um, uh, study uh, that I'm doing. Uh, you can see that there's, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. So as you know, like what you look at the two curves, either separate, if they're different, then the one that's higher is usually the one that has obviously better survival outcomes. So Asian and Pacific Islanders have better survival than whites. We already know that. But again, this whole concept of masking, when we disaggregate out um, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders compared to the other, um, this is a study where I'm disaggregating out South, Southeast and East Asian, at, at least. Um, you see that Pacific, uh, yeah, Pacific Islanders have very different um, survival outcomes for breast cancer. And this is true when we adjust for other things, um, including social economic status, um, education, and that sort of thing. So. Um, data disaggregation is a huge thing that I work on, um, uh, and yeah, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk more about this at another time too. So just to quickly wrap up, these are just four tips that I have for all of you, you know, throughout your, you know, from first year of med school to having entering your residency and beyond. These are four tips that I think are going to be helpful for you. I think one is find really good mentors and sponsors. I wouldn't be here today without all of the mentors that I've had. So the difference between mentorship and sponsorship is, is, is very important to understand. Mentorship is someone who's gonna be with you, sit with you and, and, and like talk about your path, talk about kind of how to improve day to day or, or month to month, that sort of thing. But sponsors are like department chairs or people with a lot of power who are who have a lot of opportunities for you, who have the grants, who have you know access to all the committees and they're gonna put you out in the front and be like, you do this, you're gonna you're gonna be awarded this this and this if you like work on these projects, right? But they're not the ones who are gonna be like with you day to day. That's what, those are your mentors. So remember that concept of mentorship and sponsorship because it's really important to to have both. Um, so that's that. Tip number two is stay in your own lane. You know, throughout medical school, I compared myself a lot to other people, right? Like you look at the bell shaped curve, I'm like, oh wow, I'm on the bottom. And so when you Compare yourself to others, it can be really like negative and toxic, you know, to um, 
to, to compare yourself to others. So as much as you can, and I know it's really hard for medical students, but as much as you can, try and stay in your own lane, focus on what you need to get accomplished and don't worry about other people because honestly, that's just extra stress you're adding to yourself that is not helpful. And I've been there, we have all been there, but as much as you can, just try and stay in your own lane. Um, point number three is just, you know, focus on your strength. As much as like, I did not like cardiology, um, you know, I, I try to transform that of like, okay, I'm gonna like focus on a research project so I can really dive deep down into kind of a topic in cardiology and, and get better from it. And so, um, you know, for, for me, I know that I'm not gonna be a, a internal medicine doctor or like I'm, I'm very poor at uh, like knowing everything about everything. And I wanna just focus on something small. And so that's, you know, focus on, be true to yourself, know what your strengths are and go for it for that. Um, and, and also strengths that you're passionate about is going to really lead you um, in the right direction because in the long run, you won't get burnt out. And then lastly, take wellness seriously. I, you know, I, I've been in medical school, it wasn't the case, PhD wasn't the case, but now as a resident, I'm trying to make sure I sleep more, I'm eating right, exercising, like I woke up at 5.30 this morning, you know, worked out. I think you have to do those things because if you don't take care of yourself, you will burn out. And you, it will, like, we have the highest rates of all careers, right, of burnout and, and, and suicide and, and, you know, mental health problems. And uh, it's because we are a select group of people who enter this field, but also we, there are real stresses. Like when you're in the ICU, right? You people are dying all the time, and and you you kind of have to live with that and like learn how to cope, but also um, move on to the next patient. And so like it's very we're in a very stressful job, and um, that's why I think that you know take wellness seriously. And I don't mean like wellness committee things. Like don't join another committee. Like that's not helpful. Like. Focus on what you enjoy in life, what you're passionate about, and, and go for that. And with that, that's my talk. Sorry I was a little long. I know that we're over, but I'm, I'm here, uh, you know, after this talk too, um, uh, feel free to um, get my email or whatever. I'm happy to chat with any of you over the phone or like talk about kind of strategies to get to residency and that sort of thing. But thanks. Thank you to Dr. Kulakula and Dr. Tapara for your wonderful presentations. Um, we'll now open the floor to audience, audience questions. Um, hi, thank you so much for this great talk. Sorry about the background noise, I'm in a cafe. Um, I would love to hear from either of you, like what you think needs to get done. Like what is on your, your wish list for like Native Hawaiian and Pacifica Health um, going forward, you know, next five years, 10 years, 50 years. Um, I know it's a big question, but I just, I would love to hear your dreams. Oh, okay. I guess I'll go first then. Uh, thank you. For, that's a big question. Uh, it's a long wish list. Um, well, obviously, we have to reconcile the issue of the overthrow, the situation we're in. You know, this, this, the federal government does, does not really recognize Native Hawaiians as uh, we don't have the same relationship as American Indians, Alaska Natives as, you know, as they do. So thus, we're kind of kept out of a lot of federal funding sources and opportunities. Um, I know a while ago there was an attempt with the CACA bill to get federal recognition. That was also controversial. Uh, but something has to be done for us to gain access to more resources without having to uh, co contend with the, with, with the uh, Constitution uh, as the uh, barrier to us. Uh, unlike Na American Indians, Alaska Natives are a special case, right? So they don't have to, um, uh, it can be race-based for them versus Native Hawaiians. The other thing is the state of Hawaii, although this is Hawaii and we're from here, doesn't even have a similar recognition, really. I mean, it recognizes us, yes, and we have uh, under const uh, the, the, uh, the Hawaii State Constitution, uh, uh, the Formed Office of Hawaiian Affairs and certain things. But we still are treated like everyone else. We we don't we're not afforded certain uh, privileges or accommodations as the host culture that's really lost everything. 
I mean, if you imagine we lost our lands, we lost our sovereignty, uh, and everyone else benefited. Everyone else benefited from this, right? A lot of our resources, everyone else benefit. If you don't know, Iolani School, for example, great school, is primarily the third and uh, Queen, Kamehameha uh, the fourth and Queen Amo, sorry. Uh, so there is so much benefit to the broader community, but yet Native Hawaiians don't get this benefit. We don't even get special taxes for us to address our own issues. We tried many years ago to pass state legislation that would allow us to tap into the, uh, the transient uh, accommodation tax, right? I think you might've heard a few things on the news about that. Some of the counties are getting more from it. There's some of that's being used for the rail in Honolulu, for example. And we, we were asking for some of those funds and it brings in millions and millions. At the time, I think it was 56, $57 million a year to the state. We're asking for a small portion of that. But you gotta remember tourism is, is really built on the backs of native Hawaiian culture and people. That's the reason people come to Hawaii, right? Uh, they don't go, they come here and they go see hula. They see Hawaiian shows, Polynesian shows. And they go into our Hawaiian communities like Waimanalo create traffic, create hazards but yet it's under-resourced that community and their infrastructure. So I'm going on and on, but you asked a very broad question. That's on my, my wish list for, our, for us as Native Hawaiians. Again, I'm focusing on the upstream factors because if we can change that, I truly believe we will see less of a, a gap in health, uh, health problems that we see now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think just to be very, Specific in terms of a wish list item, I think for me, um, I'm a I'm a data scientist, right? I'm a physician scientist, and and I like data. I think that a lot of the issues that Dr. Kulukula is mentioning, right, relies on the fact that we have to be recognized, and so that transparency of who we are and the understanding of who we are is important. So I think transparency of of data is is really important for me, and what I mean by that is in many of the studies that come out, um, whether it's just you know report legal reports or if it's actually like JAMA-based data um, uh, publications, we oftentimes either erase Native Hawaiian or the Pacific Islanders as a group or aggregate it into Asian and therefore erasing all the disparities that, that are very stark. I know that there's inter-ethnic um, group variances within Asian. I totally understand that. Well, like NHPI as a as a group is 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 kind of very 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 different, and I think that that distinction has to be made a little bit more within our medical community and scientific community, especially in the public uh, public health space. It needs to be recognized that NHPI are different, and again, this is a federally recognized difference of one of the five racial categories. And I I get it. You can say race is a construct, social construct, all these things, but it's a surrogate. It is a true surrogate for a lot of the social determinants of health that Dr. Kolokolo was mentioning. And so again, my my number one in terms of what I want is disaggregation of the data. And let's start with that first, the NHPI versus Asian, and then that's further disaggregate Asian. I think that especially, maybe we can't get all 30 ethnic groups. Uh, and I think, I personally think from a data perspective, that's too unrealistic, but Southeast, East, South, like I think that that's totally doable and no one's doing it. Like no one is doing it. And I think that, it has to come within us as like a PI community to kind of advocate for that, but because um, uh, no one else is doing it. The people with the power are the people with the data and they're not doing it. So we have to do it. So that's my two cents. Thanks, oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, so I have a question as well. Um, going back to the, uh, conditions like diabetes and hypertension or suicide and depression uh, that Pacific Islanders are more susceptible to um, than maybe the general population of the United States. Um, do, can we explain those exclusively in terms of poor social determinants of health? Um, or do you think that there's anything about the American diet that just doesn't sit as well with like Pacific Islanders as it does with, uh, say, Caucasians. I ask this question because I married a Tongan and just being married to them and noticing how we have to kind of adjust diet or spending Thanksgiving with them. Um, 
it, it seems odd that th they eat a lot of fish, um, and yet diabetes is such a problem. Like, how does that work? I can touch a little bit on that. Uh, actually, they don't eat as much fish as their ancestors did. Unfortunately, they eat more canned foods and canned fish, perhaps, <laughs> so, salmon and so forth. So, and what we're seeing, so I think it is a culture, it's, it's in a social determinant of health issue, right? Because it's a poverty issue. It's an economic issue. It's also an issue of uh, uh, the altering of food ecosystems in our islands, right? That, and took away the traditional practices of fishing, uh, agriculture that we once did that will allow us the skill sets to, to do be self-sustainable uh, sustainable and subsistence living. So I think the move away from that it is really a Western diet that is killing us, right? The uh, fast food, calorie dense foods, foods that are often cheaper and easier. I mean, people that live in Hawaii often work two jobs, yeah? And they don't have time to get from job A to job B in traffic. In, in Hawaii, if you don't know, in Honolulu especially, to just get two miles can take you sometimes 20 minutes, half an hour, right? To get 16 miles in Hawaii in the morning and afternoon takes an hour, hour, half for people that, you know, I, I know the LA traffic is bad, but I've been in LA traffic. You keep moving at least. In Hawaii, it can literally come to a dead stop for a couple of minutes. Um, so people have a force to eat, uh, you know, get fast food, you know, and if you, we talk about eating healthy, uh, to eat healthy, you got to shop on a regular basis. You got to go to a shop, you know, to a market, you got to get, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables because they only last so long. And that takes time. And exercise takes time when people work two jobs and they're just tired and wiped out. So there's so much factors. I know diet, I, I do think social determinants, it, 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 it's a big factor. Of course, it, it interacts or interplays with biological factors. But, you know, uh, I presented a, uh, if it's biology, it must be the admixture with other ethnic groups because I showed you 1778 healthy, robust population, all of a sudden we're not so robust. In fact, we, we, we're coming out with a paper soon. Uh, interesting, there is a, when we look at Native Hawaiian only and Native Hawaiian mixed, uh, of course, both are higher than other ethnic groups, but it's the Hawaiian mix actually that seems to have higher, in this case, cardiovascular disease risk, which is interesting. I think, uh, I don't know about Dr. Tapara, but I think our cancer center colleagues here have published a few things, but it might, well, I think cancer center colleagues, but it might have been in diabetes rather than cancer specific because they do have that multi-ethnic study. So there's something going on, uh, you know, whether it's a cultural shift, whether it's a biological interplaying with environment and behavior, it's complex stuff. It's not, it's very complex. I, I definitely agree. It's, it's multifactorial in so many different ways. I mean, as a son of a fisherman, like, I, I get, my dad has been battling like pre-diabetes for forever and he's fisherman tries to eat right but it yeah it it's very complex like th this whole thing I think that um you know in terms of uh social determinants of health like you know yeah totally totally true someone who went to school in town but like from the mountain like I gr grew up eating like Portuguese sausage egg rice from McDonald's like every single morning for breakfast uh, and then like, you know, Khmer schools fed us really well. And then like, and then I would go home and eat like McDonald's or Taco Bell for dinner, like on the ride home, like every morning, every afternoon for, from, from practice from swimming. And like, that was my life or job juice, one of the two, like, it was like one of those like super high calorie diets. Right. And, and I, even though I was an athlete, I definitely didn't have the same body as everyone else. I'll tell you that much. But I think, yeah, it's a really complex. I mean, again, I'm a geneticist. I'm a not a geneticist. I'm like a basic science research, bench researcher who did a lot of genetics. Plus, I'm a physician. So as a physician scientist, I, I, I something tells me that there are like genetic variants. Um, because again, especially with Pacific Islander, or especially with Native Hawaiians. Remember the U-shaped curve? We bottlenecked. Like there was like definitely a selection of genes at some point that that makes us uh, more homogeneous, at least at at that point in, in time. Not maybe not now because we're very we're the most multicultural uh, or most multiracial ethnic uh, or racial group of all the groups. Um, but yeah, so I think that there was a bottleneck. There are certain genes maybe predisposing. 
But I definitely agree. I think the proportion of like the social determinants of health kind of factors rather than biological factors are definitely influencing things. But then again, like I have 10 family members with cancer, like a lot of, especially being someone in cancer, a lot of my like um, attendings and things are like, did you get genetic testing or anything? I'm like, what are they going to test for? It's such a wide variety of, of, of cancers that are affected in my family. Like there's no, there's nothing that overlaps all of those. And so I'm not, I'm like neuroblastoma, really. Like that's, that's like a pediatric cancer is so different. And so I'm not, I, I'm not hundred percent convinced that at least with my personal background, that that is like genetics. Like my wife, for example, her mom died when she was 13 from breast cancer and actually had, you know, the, the BRCA mutation. So that's, that's very different. Right. Um, uh, and again, who did they do their research on? It was not Pacific Islanders, right? It was like, oh, they're not only a white population. That's how they found it. It's because they have representations, because they have transparency and they have the numbers, right? And we're getting left out as Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians um, from, from a lot of these studies, so. I just want to add to that because you just, you made me think of something. So my dad is the last of 11 kids. My dad was the last of 11. My, my dad died of heart disease. Okay, but, but it's interesting, most of his, majority of his brothers and sisters died of cancer. And it varied, the cancer, the type of cancer varied. But what was interesting is that my dad was adopted by his auntie and he was actually raised uh, on a different island in town. All, what, what all the, the, the brothers and sisters who died of cancer who were older actually were raised on plantation on Maui. So I, and, and then there are three other siblings who were also hot night out. None of them died of cancer. One died of complications due to diabetes. The other is still alive, going strong. And my dad died of heart disease. Okay. So I really think the pesticides and something, some environmental toxin, maybe, because all of them died of cancer and they died in their forties and fifties. Right. So very young. And so me, you know, so interesting, right? All same biological, same genetics. Although the younger ones, maybe they can say that's a confounder, they were younger or something changed, but they weren't raised, all three of them weren't raised on plantation. No, and, and very quickly on that point of age, right? Like cancer is a disease of aging. When I see my patients in the, in the, in the hospital, they're like 80s, 90s, they're old, right? But like my family too, like 30s, they're like in their 30s or, or pediatric, right? So it's very um yeah it like there's a lot of younger pacific islanders who are getting cancer like even even in the hospital right now i was on call i got um there's a really um sad and uh, lady um and she has sarcoma and her she uh you know went to and this is social determinants of health too that she was from vegas got worked up no one believed her didn't she's in pain so much pain for a whole year she flew from hawaii actually to vegas to take care of her dad who was dying of lung cancer actually died of lung cancer and then she has so much pain they said it was like in her mind blah 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 didn't get any imaging ended up getting imaging and then found out that her whole entire leg was sarcoma and so like then she came to Stanford and now we're treating her very palliatively. But it's like a lot of that social terms of health too, right? Of like, oh, she didn't get any of the proper workup. No one even took an x-ray of her leg. If they would have just taken an x-ray, they would have seen that her whole leg is just tumor. And so a lot of social terms of health, but yeah, why is she a 30 something year old with sarcoma of her entire leg? It's a, these are very interesting questions. Sorry, I'm gonna have to jump off. Uh... Uh, so I have to return to the family for the weekend. We have our oldest in town from San Francisco for the holidays. So uh, mahalo to everyone. I really appreciate this. My best of all, my best to all of you. Aloha. Thank you. Yeah, we are over time. Um, if anyone has additional questions for Dr. Kolakula and Dr. Tapara, um, you can also submit them to NHPI director at apamsa.org. Um, but thank you so, so much to our speakers for um, sharing their time and expertise with us today. Um, they were such informative, eye-opening presentations. And thank you um, to you all for attending our workshop today. Um, our National APAMSA Conference will be on January 7 to 9 at the Ohio State University. And you can find information on how to register on our website. And thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your Saturday.